Good morning again, everybody. We are going to continue through Isaiah this morning. If you got your Bibles, turn to chapter 7. That's where we're going to start this morning. The next section is, uh, it's really chapter 7 through 12, and it's talking about some of the the, uh, the warnings and, and what's going to happen, and it talks about Isaiah's role in advising the leaders of the day and what, what is going to happen, and it goes you know, seven, chapter 7 through 12. Uh, we're only going to talk about chapter 7 and 8 today, 9 and 10 uh, next Sunday, and then 11 and 12 to follow on with that. But if you remember last week, we said uh, we took a little break from the historical kind of chronological order of things, and Isaiah called in this, this time where he was talking about how he was called to be a prophet. So now we get back into the correct chronological order here with chapter 7. So uh, we've, we've really heard this idea of Isaiah being a prophet. We've heard his commission uh, to, uh, to, uh, to speak for God. And now we kind of see that going into work and him being this advisor to the king. This takes place in chapter 7 and around 735 B.C., just to kind of get your, your mindset on, on where that is. Um, Ahaz is the king, Isaiah is the prophet, and he is in the, the king's group of advisors talking to the, to the king and advising the king and, and explaining what God's direction for the kingdom is, and that's what he's doing. Right now, as we start chapter 7, the politics in the world around Israel and Judah and these surrounding communities is kind of a mess. You got a lot going on. You've got these kings that are in power, but you've got these other groups that want to come against the the other people in the area. The big thing that we'll talk about in the next couple weeks is a couple countries called Syria and Ephraim are coming up against Assyria. That's kind of the idea. They've allied together. They're going to go up against Assyria, who is a superpower. They're going to go against those guys. But what they've said, they went to Judah and said, if you join us, we'll spare you. But if you don't join us, then we will attack you and we will devastate you as well. So that's, that's kind of where we see it here. We've got this, this force that's coming to get Judah's help and assistance and threatening them if they don't. Uh, the advisors in the king's day kind of think that's not a bad idea. It sounds pretty safe. They're, they'll join up with a bunch of people. Otherwise, they'll get destroyed. Isaiah sees a different outcome if they go down that path. And we kind of see that come to a little bit of a head here in chapter 7 and 8 of Isaiah. So we got a lot going on, a lot of political stuff going around there. And we've got Isaiah, and that's kind of who we're talking about today and learning about and, and hearing his point of view, kind of in the middle of all of this and and at odds with the, the people advising the king and delivering a message that is, as we've seen from Isaiah a few times, not always the easiest to deliver. So what we see here is, is a situation I think we find ourselves all in at some point in time, advising the king on the wars that are about to come, right? That's, we're all familiar with that? No, we're not. That's okay to laugh at that. What we, what we, are, we are, though, is in impossible situations, okay? We're in these places where we don't know where to go where we've got something going on and it just seems like if I say this or I do this, I'm not going to win. If I say this and I do this, I can't win. You ever been in one of those places? In one of those situations where it just seems like you want to run away and hide and curl up in a ball and just disappear for a minute? I swear I have these once a week where at, at work I say or do something stupid. I, I don't think you can any of you imagine me saying anything stupid, but sometimes I do. And I say something and I, and I just have to it's walk out and take a walk and get some fresh air. And, and a lot of times what I think is I should just go home because this, this was bad. Right? You ever been there? Yeah, I've been there a lot. I think we find Isaiah kind of in one of those situations where it's... If I say it, I'm going, to look, I'm going to look this way. If I don't say it, then it's not going to work out good for me. So how can we deliver this message and let the people know not only what God's message is, but what Isaiah's continued message has been up to this point, that there is always hope no matter what goes on, that God is, is saying this is what's going to happen, that if this is the path that it goes down, that's, that's how it is. But bigger than that, there is hope for what God has in store for the, the nation that he is speaking to here. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to Isaiah chapter 7. We'll get into the scripture here. I want to read the first nine verses here to kind of give you an idea of what's going on here. So let's see what Isaiah has to say here in uh, chapter 7. Now it came to pass in the day of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzaz, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramelon, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but could not prevail against it. And it was told of the house of David, saying, Serious forces are developed in Ephraim. So his heart was, 
and his and the heart of the people were moved as the trees of the wood are moved with the wind. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go now and meet with Ahaz, you and Shear Jeshub, your son, and the high aqueduct at the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. And say to him, Take heed and be quiet. Do not fear or be faint-hearted for these two stubs of smoking firebands, for the fierce anger of Rezian Syria and the son of Ramalek. Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Ramalek have plotted evil against you, saying, Let's go up to Judah and trouble it, and let's make a gap in its wall for ourselves, and set as a king over them the son of Tabal. Thus says the Lord, It shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. Within sixty-five years Ephraim will be broken, so that all will not be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Seph- Samaria is Ramalah's son. If you will not believe, surely you will not be established." So what's Isaiah saying here? Here's what's going on, right? Here's the political climate in the day, kind of what we talked about a minute ago. And what's happening there is God says, There's, this is what's going to happen. They're going to get together, and they're going to say, we're going to go up against Jerusalem, and we're going to attack it, and we're going to make a hole in the wall, right? We're going to set ourselves as kings over them. We're going to establish ourselves as rulers of this nation. And God says, that's what they say, but don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So here's Isaiah's prophecy, right? Danger is coming, but there is always hope. Because what's he say? What's the message in in, uh, verses 7, 8, and 9? Basically this. That there are leaders in these countries, and those leaders are just that. They're leaders of a country. But on Israel's side is God. God leads this nation. God leads these people. And that's more powerful than any of these people that, that, that can throw stuff against them, right? And that's where we... We find, uh, we find Isaiah speaking here to these people. It may seem dire, it may seem scary, it may seem tricky, it may seem bad. All these people are coming against you, but you know what? Don't worry, because all they are can't add up to all that God is. And that's the message of hope that Isaiah is delivering here. It's going to be a tricky time. There's going to be some, some heartache and some pain, but God is in it in the end. That's hope for us, isn't it? In those impossible situations we find ourselves in, in those times when we just want to roll up into a ball and hide away, we can think, yes, all of that is bad, and yes, it's embarrassing, and yes, it hurts, and yes, it's painful, and yes, I want to run away, and yes, I don't want to deal with people. But all of that together, and all the bad that can come against me in that, does not stack up to the goodness that is in God and that God is in me. That's what we can have hope in. That's our hope. That when life does go the way life goes, God is still there and God is still bigger than that problem. And that's what's, what's going on here in Isaiah's day. So now you can kind of see his mindset. He's advising the king. His advice is things are going to get bad, but God is going to be bigger than that. God has a plan. Things are going to look bad. Things are going to head bad. But in the end, God is still going to prevail. That's God's idea. So as Isaiah continues to advise the king and continues to reveal things to him, we kind of continue through this from from chapter 7 through chapter 12 of the the discourse that kind of goes on here. The next thing that kind of comes to pass here as Isaiah talks about it is this other prophecy. I'm not going to read it, but it starts there in chapter 10, and it talks about this conversation that God and the king have have. Uh, with each other through Isaiah. And God says to Ahaz, the king, he says, make a sign, ask for a sign. Ask me for something and I will show you how good I am. I will show you how good God is. I will show you how much this means. Now Ahaz, it's almost like he doesn't want to be tricked. And he says in verse 12, I won't ask and I won't test God. Now we've seen this before, right? We've seen where people put God to the test and it's been bad. Here God asks him, to ask Ahaz to give him, ask for a sign, and Ahaz doesn't come up with one, but God comes up with his own. And here's what God says. Basically, a virgin's going to conceive, and he's going to be born, and you're going to call him Emmanuel. That's in verse 14 of Isaiah chapter 7. Does that sound familiar to anybody else? It's not Christmas. Christmas in May today, right? 
That's, that's the story that we hear, right? That's, that's the, the words that the angel delivers. A virgin shall conceive and you shall call him Emmanuel. That's the message of Christmas, right? That's the message of Christ being born. So, so God said, all this is going to happen, but don't worry. My people won't vanish forever. That's what it sounds like and that's what people want, but I've got this bigger plan. You want to see something big? Here's a big sign. Look for this big thing. You want to know how good God is and how loving God is and how caring God is for his people? Here's what you will see is this virgin will have a son and you shall call him Emmanuel and this is how this will go. The child will, will come to, to know good and evil and, and, and be forsaken and all of this happens and Isaiah starts here, God through Isaiah starts to bring this message of hope not just for the nation of Judah that Isaiah is talking about here but now for the whole world. That's a sign, right? And Isaiah is delivering this prophecy. Now, I want to take a little, little side trail here and, and make a note of a, a way that this passage has, has been interpreted quite a bit, um, which it, it may be right as well. We don't really know. This is obviously pointing to Jesus, but there's this other thought that says this is a, a, a prophecy that is being spoken directly to King Ahaz to kind of give him a timeline of how things are going to go and how the kingdom in Isaiah's day presently will come to pass, right? So they're saying, well, okay, a virgin will give birth or a young woman will get married and then have a child and then that child will grow up because then it says uh, down a little bit later, for when the child becomes to know good and evil, then some other things will happen. So it's giving kind of a timeline. Somebody who isn't yet with child will become with child and have a child and that child will grow up 10, 12, 13 years from now, and in that time, something bad will happen. And if you look at the map of the way things went out, you look at the, the timeline of how things kind of happened, that's kind of what took place. Israel gets attacked, and, and Judah is overtaken, and, and there's this, this poverty time, and, and all this kind of happens and lines up with it. So this, this is how good God is, right? Like he can say words that, that are predicting something that's going to come a long time away and also be very relevant to what we're experiencing today. That's our God. I mean, we're reading prophecies here in Isaiah and words in Isaiah that were written about 730 B.C. That's a long time ago, right? We're, we're getting up on like 2,500, 3,000 years ago these words were written, and they still apply to us today. That's our God. That's what he can do. We can look at this and we can say, I can relate to what Isaiah is saying. I can relate to, to how these people were thinking. It makes sense to me. That's God. And that's what he was at work with here. Whether he meant this for Isaiah and to speak directly to King Ahaz and to kind of make a timeline for the prophecy, or whether he meant this for be for us to say, wow, God had this plan for Christ in place a long time ago. Either way, I think they're probably both true. God had to speak this at that time, but God also wanted us to read it today and say, wow, Jesus meets that prophecy as well. It's pretty neat, right, that God can do that stuff. So here in Isaiah, we see that gospel message that continues to be woven in throughout this whole book. As Isaiah prophesies and leads and teaches, he continues to point everything back to Jesus Christ. And here it is again. There will be a sign, and it will be big, and I will show you how much I love you. And don't worry, no matter what this world throws at us, Christ will still overcome all of that. Christ will still win all of that. That being said, Isaiah keeps going here. And he says there will be this time whenever dangers come. Right? And what happens? Right? He says that Assyria is going to be used to do something. What's he saying in verse 18, right? Comes to pass that the Lord will whistle the fly, the furthest part of the rivers of Egypt, and the people from Assyria will come, and it will be not good, right? They're going to come, and they're going to attack, and they're going to they're going to be pretty evil, and they're going to, it's going to hurt, and things are going to go the wrong way. It's not going to be a good place to be. This is how it's going to happen. This guy's got this idea. God sees this plan. God knows how all of this will take place. We can take comfort in it, that God understands it, that God gets it, that God knows this is coming. We've always heard, right, that God won't give us more than we can handle. It sure sounds like this is a lot more than somebody can handle. But, but, but the truth in that is that God won't give us anything that we can't handle with him. 
And that's what's going on here. God's saying, this is all going to happen. But if you stay true to me and you stay by me, there is this promise of something better on the other side. And so, yes, Assyria is going to come and they're going to judge and, and it's going to be a mess. It's a good analogy for life, right? Life is going to happen. Life isn't going to be perfect. Just because we come to church on Sunday and we worship God, we read the Bible, doesn't mean that everything in life goes without problems. Sometimes things just go bad. But we can always go back to that verse 14. We can always go back to reflecting that Jesus is still the answer, that Jesus was still the promise, that no matter what happens in this world, God is there with us. That God knew it, God saw it, and God wanted to take us through it for a reason. He wants to deliver us to the other side so that we can see that God is bigger than that. So he goes into chapter 8 and he continues talking. And he says this is what's going to happen. Assyria is going to invade the land. Assyria is going to come. But you're not by yourself. He uses a, an interesting way of speaking through Abraham here. If you, if you caught that back in chapter 7, we read about, uh, as, as God said to Isaiah, he says, go and meet the king, you and your son. Now his son is, uh, is named a, a name that is Sheer Jeshub. We can't really pronounce well. I'm probably messing that all up. But what it really means is a remnant shall return. Prophecy, right there, the name of the child. Because what happens later on, everybody gets out of this land, but a remnant of people come back. And then here, what's God say? He says, write down on a scroll this name that I'm not going to try to mess up. He writes it down on a scroll. He has a child. He names that child this name, which actually means... Uh, it means God with us. P pretty neat, right? No, it means speed the spoil, hasten the booty. That body, that's what it means. It means, so here's what's going to happen. A remnant is going to come back in the first part. In this part, God's saying, here's what's going to happen. Assyria is going to take you over, and you're going to bring this child to bring this prophecy that says, speed the spoil, hasten the booty. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to be overtaken. So God uses actually Abraham's children and the way he names his children to bring that message to the people. And that's what happens in chapter 8. God's saying, this is going to take place. Now he uses another pretty interesting uh, technique here down a little bit later. I want to read those verses in, uh, in chapter 8. Down in verse 6, he talks about waters and how water flows and how water goes in a different way. Look at verse 6. Inasmuch as the people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow swaffly, softly and rejoice in resin at Ramelah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river strong and mighty. The king of Assyria in all his glory, he will go up to all the channels and over all the banks. He will pass through Judah. He will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the necks and to the stretch out of his wings will fulfill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Be shattered, you, O peoples, who broken in pieces, give ear all you far countries, gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces, gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces, take counsel together, but it will come to nothing, speak the word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. These are the idea of waters. So we say, hey, the waters of Jerusalem, the waters of my people, they flow nice, but you didn't want those. So guess what, you're going to be overtaken by this Assyria, it's going to come like a flood, quick, swift, and total destruction. It's going to wipe you out. But what's God say in the end? You're going to be shattered. You're going to be broken. You're going to be down. But in the end, God is with us. This will not continue. This will not stand. This has an end. And in the end, God is glorified. Again, kind of a metaphor for life, right? Look, things are going to come. We're going to be washed away. We're going to be knocked down. We're going to feel like we're destroyed. It's going to happen quickly. It's going to happen suddenly. It's going to happen in a way that just overwhelms us. We don't know what to do. But in the end, we can still have hope, as Isaiah is saying here, that God is with us. Because you know what? Sometimes it doesn't seem that way, does it? It seems like everybody's against us and everybody's got something out against us. It seems like the world is on the other side of us. Isaiah understood that. And God understood that Isaiah got that. Because if you look at the next section here of chapter 8, we, we hear about something we don't really understand. We don't know all the details of it. But God speaks to Isaiah, through Isaiah, and says, Hey, don't pay attention to these conspiracies. Don't pay attention to these threats. Now, I don't know what those conspiracies are. I don't know what those 
threats are. We can imagine a little bit based on the political climate that there are these factions of people, ones who are pro the king and anti the king and pro the advisors and anti the advisors and probably without doubt really pro Isaiah and anti Isaiah. And as all this turmoil is going around in the countries around them, the, the CNNs and Fox Newses of the day, right, are having their battles and, and, and spreading words and talking to people. And you've got these groups of people who have their different opinions. And some of them are against Isaiah and some of them are saying against what God is trying to advise here. And what God is saying to Isaiah is don't be afraid of these conspiracies. It may feel like everybody is against you. It may feel like nobody is on your side. It may even feel like, like God is saying you could be defeated, as he's said here. But that doesn't mean God's not with us. He actually gives some advice. What's he say in verse 13 here, right? You've got all this stuff against you. You've got all these people that are anti you. You've got all these other things going on. But in verse 13, he says, let God be your fear. Let God be your dread. And we've heard of this concept before, right? Fearing God. I've heard of this idea that we should fear God and, and, and respect God, not be afraid of God, not be afraid to talk to him, but understanding of his power and his might and that he has a will that will be done, that we can't stand in the way, that we can't get in his way, that we can't stop what he has from happening. That's, that's where we should be with God. God's saying, don't be afraid of the people. Don't be afraid of, of making them happy or pleasing them. Don't be afraid of, of what this life has to bring. Be afraid of not doing what I want because what I want is what is good and that's what's going to lead to this path and to these promises and to the stuff I've got. But if you do not what I want, go against that in order to please somebody else, there's going to be consequences. We've seen what God uh, says can happen here, right? People be destroyed and wiped out and flood waters and all, whole thing. And that's possible if we don't follow God. What we need to do is have that healthy fear. If you've got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 12 real quick. We'll read a, a little passage on uh, what it means to fear God. It's one of those, those tricky things that we live with every day as Christians, right? That we've got to figure out how to respect God but not be afraid of God. We can still approach him. We can still talk to him. We can still confess to him. We need to. But we also have to respect his authority and respect his position. If you go to, uh, to verse 4 of chapter 12, Jesus starts here to talk about uh, the fear of God. This is Jesus talking. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and that after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are more value than of sparrows. Also I say to you, whoever confesses me before men, send him, send him the Son of Man will also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven him. But to he, him who blasphemies against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now when, you bring, when they bring you to the synagogue and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. So what's, what's God saying here? What's Jesus saying? He's saying, yeah, there's a lot that this world can do, but it ends somewhere. What God's got in store and what God's got the power to do is beyond anything this world really understands. God's power and, and understanding and wisdom and guidance and leadership lasts all through eternity. And that's what we have to respect. That's what we have to honor. We have to honor God with our lives, not the ones around us that are here today and gone tomorrow. Right? We want to impress God, not impress people because their opinions will change overnight. People go from hate to love to indifference in, in, in days, right? That's people. Well, what we need to be concerned with is how we, we appear to God. We don't have to fear the world because God takes care of the, the birds and the plants and the animals and all of that. God takes care of that even though the world doesn't take care of them or respect them or honor them. God still provides for them. We are the same way. 
God will take care of us in, in a greater way. He also says there's going to be times when we're going to be faced with this decision. Right? When we're faced with this decision, we're going to be brought, as he says, in front of the, the synagogue and the magistrates. That's probably not what's going to happen to us, but we are going to be in this time when we have to make a decision. Do we follow God's leading and the Holy Spirit, or do we follow our own instincts? And if we follow our own, then we start to fall short. But if we follow God's, then, then he's described here once again as many times as being a, a rock. Being the rock. If we build upon God as our rock, then we will stand. If we believe in God and keep our faith and keep true to him, then no matter what this world has in store for us, we can have hope. That's Isaiah's message to the king here in these chapters. Things are going to happen. Things are going to get tricky. I understand that the people have an opinion and and they want you to follow that and and you as, as king want to please the people, but more importantly, we should be wanting to please God because even though all this chaos is going on and all of this seems like it's very scary and very bad place to be, God has a plan to get you through it. And if we stay true to our rock and stay true to our God and stay in fear of God and not the consequences of all of this stuff, then God will get us through it and God's will will be done and will be blessed. And not only us, but nations to come. Nations and nations and, and all of creation as he promises there in in the middle of chapter 7. So that's the beginning of Isaiah's Isaiah's journey here advising the king. We'll we'll get into it more. If you want to read ahead, we'll be in 9 and 10 and then 11 and 12. So go ahead and read that. Uh, It's it's more kind of this idea. The big thing is to, to look through that as you see it. Look for the dangers that Isaiah talks about, but look for the gospel hope that Isaiah also preaches about because that's what keeps us and it keeps uh, Israel going during this time. Anybody have anything this morning? All right, let's sing one more song.